down through the years as a preacher would begin with a devotional reading of a few moments ago, might be out to jump to various conclusions as to where he's going to go with the lesson. And there's so many different places you could go, obviously. With the realization that here Jesus comes because of Caesarea Philippi, he's been doing his work, he's been teaching, he's been performing miracles for quite some time now. And people have had the opportunity to draw various conclusions about who he is and what he's all about. They cannot deny that the things that he says is totally different than what they've heard before. And while it is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that they should have been aware of, then it's certainly not what they are used to, for sure. At the same time, as he's performed the various miracles, then it's obvious that as Nicodemus drew the conclusion, obviously God is with such a man who has the capacity to do that. But then when they begin to draw their conclusions about who he was, then you're somewhat taken aback. Did Jeremiah ever perform miracles such as these? John the Baptist spoke in <clears throat> many ways concerning the at hand kingdom, maybe a similarity there. But obviously, their misunderstanding was corrected when Jesus turned the attention to the apostles. Who do you say that I am? And it is how we answer that question right there that determines everything about us what our motivation is, what we place as being important in our lives. And everything that we think about has to be channeled through who we consider Jesus Christ to be. And of course, it was the affirmation that, Jesus, that was made here to Jesus in inquisitive question to Peter, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that brought the success later on in Peter being given the tremendous responsibility of preaching the gospel on the day of Pentecost to the rest of the apostles. But there's also something involved in making an application of the truth that's set forth plainly here, beginning in Matthew chapter 16, and it relates to the topic that we have presented here from a passage of Scripture in the book of Galatians chapter 2. See if you can draw in your mind a conclusion between Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then, a few years later, with the events surrounding Paul coming to Jerusalem and meeting with the apostles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Now, obviously, to set aside the last part of that verse, then we know that what's being spoken of here is that Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and, and all those other fellows, they went to basically the Gentile world. That was non-Jewish, thus, at least in the eyes of Jews, heathen. Well, at the same time, Peter and most of the apostles who stayed at Jerusalem they were, in fact, apostles to the circumcision, or to the Jews. But notice what Paul makes mention of relative to when he first made contact with the disciples in Jerusalem. When they realized what was being accomplished, when they heard of the widespread acceptance of the gospel by the heathen world, they extended the right hand fellowship to Paul and to Barnabas. What does that mean? They extended the right hand of fellowship to them. Does that mean, just as it does today, just a common greeting and the shaking of a right hand? Well, what is involved in that? And if there is something necessarily attached to apostles, as well as others in the first century, in the shaking of hands, is there any application or any principles that undergird our practice today? And if not, 
Why not? Well, let's look closely at this word that is translated fellowship here in Galatians chapter 2. Because, friends, it is a matter of Jesus Christ is the Son of God that it was possible for the apostles in Jerusalem to extend spiritual fellowship to the apostle Paul and Barnabas. At the same time, it was absolutely essential for Paul and Barnabas to recognize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in order for spiritual fellowship to be extended from them to the apostles in Jerusalem. And likewise today. What does Thayer say about this word fellowship? Joint participation used of the intimate bond which unites Christians. <clears throat> An intimate bond. You see, just in Thayer's definition there then, there's probably more than just a, a surface attachment here associated with this wonderful biblical concept made possible by Jesus being the Christ of fellowship. A joint participation. Maybe even in the point of an absence of joint participation would mean an absence of true biblical fellowship. If not, why not? Maybe so. Let's see. Let us further. Actually, old Bowles, in his commentary on the book of Acts, says this, and I love the way he explains this. It was not just the partnership of one believer with another in Christ. It was the partnership of one apostle with another in the mission of Christ. You see, it's possible. And we've used the example back in Genesis chapter 11 many times. Here were people who were in fellowship with each other. Here were people who were using the exact same terminology. Here were people who were speaking the same thing. Here were people who were united with each other. And here were people that were disobeying God. Oops, wait a minute. You, you mean there's more in this acceptable fellowship business than just being together? There's more in acceptable fellowship than just speaking the same thing. Because certainly those who were trying to build a tower that reached into heaven were speaking the same thing. But were they enjoying fellowship with God? No. Were they enjoying fellowship with each other? Yes. So which is the most important? Is it fellowship with God? Or is it fellowship with each other? You see, it would be possible for Paul to have been a heretic and those that he met with in Jerusalem to be heretics. And they extend fellowship to each other as heretics. We certainly would not be having this sermon today. But it's obvious that such could have resulted if they'd have followed the example of fellowship as in the case of building the Tower of Babel. And that distinction, friends, while it should be so clear, which is the defining line that exists between acceptance with God and not, is one that is oftentimes barred, sad. In uh, fact, uh, these things ought not to be. The mission of Christ. What is that, anything? What is the mission of Christ? Jesus came to seek and save the lost, he said, at the household of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that the mission of Christ is to seek and to save the lost. Thus, to enjoy fellowship one with another in the mission of Christ is to enjoy fellowship one with another in seeking and saving the lost. About which do we have authority concerning this matter of joint participation and fellowship in seeking and saving the lost? Well, obviously, in our desire to see to it that the Shanahans, the Campbells, and others that we have the uh, uh, wherewithal and are blessed bountifully to be able to assist in doing that, Obviously, that's a fellowship that is approved by God. We're seeking to save the lost through the means of individuals who are willing to go to foreign lands. But is that not the very reason why we have a radio program and articles in the paper and, and all such as that? Well, certainly. In the absence of authority, then we don't have any right to do those things. But with the ability to do so comes the demand that we do it, at least in some form all the way up to and including supporting 
GBN or, or whoever happens to be on the radio preaching the truth, and we have the opportunity to so support, without a doubt. <clears throat> Another definition. Fellowship was an idiom of the day for pledging friendship and acknowledging agreement. Now, friends, while that might look somewhat immaterial, for Paul and Barnabas to go to Jerusalem and to find out that here were people who were pledging their agreement with what they were doing, that was a big thing. Because it was this same Peter, on one occasion, who would not even dare think about eating a pork chop. Because he considered pork to still be common or unclean. Here was a man who later on in the same second chapter of the book of Galatians withdrew himself from these new brethren that had formerly been Gentiles, and now there were Gentiles that were brethren, because he was fearful of those who came to Antioch from, that's right, Jerusalem. It's a big difficulty. A big difficulty that we classify today as maybe being one of prejudice. Prejudice because of the color of one's skin or the nationality or the language they speak or, or whatever. Prejudice is prejudice and it is condemned. And the example that we see in the way that these things were handled in the first century draws, causes us to draw that proper conclusion. But think about this. While we know that to a certain extent, and we're going to have to put that little bit of a uh, comma to the matter, that there was an acknowledging of agreement, did that mean that when Paul and Barnabas came to Jerusalem and had the right hand of fellowship extended their way, did that mean that they agreed on everything? You see, it's real easy, it's real easy to say, we need to agree on everything. Or it's real easy to say, we don't really need to agree on much of anything. But where the rubber meets the road is when you make a distinction as to when you do and when you don't. And if you do not define those things to some extent, then you're only causing confusion. If I was to ask today, what are some things that we believe that we do not necessarily have to demand that others believe as well? How many different lists would we have of those things? And how did we come up with those lists that we have made? That's why this lesson is so very important. Are we supposed to, in pledging our friendship and acknowledging agreement with other Christians, whether they be from the other end of the valley, or Timbuktu, does that demand that we agree on everything? And think about that word, everything. Well, maybe not everything. Because if I had a choice between chocolate cone and a vanilla cone, I'm going to take vanilla. Especially soft serve. I don't care. Now, if it's real ice cream, I do but we don't have to agree on everything. We know that. Because here's some things we definitely disagree on. There's people that wear crimson colored shirts that has Alabama splattered across it, believe it or not. And there's other people who wear orange shirts with big T's on them. They know agreement there. We got people that graduate from Sequatchie County High School and people that graduate from Bledsoe County High School in this congregation. Don't agree there. But are there matters about which we must agree? And if there is an area in which we must agree, is there an area in which we can differ and still scripturally as well as logically remain in fellowship with each other in fellowship? Well, we know this to be a fact. <clears throat> we know that elders have authority. We know that if they have authority based upon the number of passages of Scripture, and here are two. We know that if elders, according to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, are to be obeyed because they rule over us as ones who must fend for us and give an answer for our souls, then involved in that 
are decisions that have to be made, not necessarily by taking a poll of the congregation as to what they want to. In what realm do they have the right to make those decisions? When elders make decisions, what is the area in which they are given the prerogative by God to make decisions? I'll give you a hint. It's the same area that God gave provisions for Moses to make decisions. I'll give you a hint. It's the same area in which Noah was given provision, given opportunity to make provisions for the constructing of the ark. Same area. Same area. Now let's see. Noah was to build the ark out of gopher wood. That must be something there that's not really given to the inside or great judgment abilities of Noah. That's right. Are there things that fit in that category as regards the decisions that elders make? Surely so. A few months ago, and we oftentimes will point to this passage of Scripture because it illustrates exactly what we're talking about. Right after Jesus had commended Peter for saying the right thing by making the good confession, Jesus turned right around and told Peter and the rest of the apostles in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, that he was giving them the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And along with the keys of the kingdom of heaven was the ability and the opportunity and the responsibility to bind those things that were bound and loose those things that were loose. In other words, there are matters that are in heaven bound. They were bound before they were made known by the apostles in the first century. They're at the same time. Matters that are loosed in heaven. They have been loosed in heaven and were loosed in heaven long before anybody started reasoning about them here on earth. We are left with what God has provided for us in His Word, and we are given the responsibility of using what He's given us to draw the conclusions that are made necessary by that evidence. And when we do that, we can make a determination as to what matters are bound and what matters are loose. Or to say it this way, What matters are matters of faith and what matters are in actuality matters of opinion. Or we say this way. We can know the difference between what is a matter of law and what is a matter of expediency. Expediency. So we look on the left side of the column, bound faith law. The right side of the column, loose opinion expediency. Would it surprise you if I told you that most of the problems faced by brethren in times past and will continue to be faced by brethren until the Lord returns are caused by brethren either being unable or unwilling to see these distinctions and going so far as to classify those things in the right column as if they were matters in the left column or vice versa. That's where the problems happen is a failure to properly distinguish between the two. And how important is this? Well, it's so important that to fail to understand these principles makes it absolutely impossible for us to give anyone the right hand of fellowship as was given by the apostles to Paul and Barnabas. That's why. There are some matters that matter. And there are some matters that don't matter. Can we know which is which? Well, if we can't learn a pitiful pickle, that's for sure. Because our eternal destiny depends upon us knowing the difference between the two. Now, let's see if we can understand some clear distinction. What if we were to go to a place like Romans chapter 6? Remember, if you will, the background from Romans chapter 6 would be Romans chapter 5. And there was a problem that existed among the thinking of these Roman Christians that God's grace was such an overwhelming entity that in actuality, the greater the sin, the bigger the grace. Because in actuality, do we not all the time say there is no sin that God's grace will not forgive? That's right. As long as that sin is repented of. That's exactly right. So that means then, of necessity, the bigger the sin, the bigger the grace. Well, no. And as he begins this sixth chapter, he says, Know ye not 
that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the death of the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now notice, Paul places himself in the number of those who had been baptized into the death of Christ. Reckon that had anything to do with him being a Christian? Was that a necessary ingredient in God's plan for the salvation of Saul of Tarsus' soul? Well, they were the ones or one. Is either a thing required, a matter of law and not of expediency, or what? Was it simply an expedient matter? Well, when we understand how that God's plan is set forth in specific detail from the beginning of the Great Commission, when Jesus commissioned the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and then said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved leading us to the draw of the conclusion that baptism is an essential ingredient in God's salvation plan, which is exactly what Paul affirmed here in Romans chapter 6. Later on in verse 17, Paul put it this way, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. When did they become servants of righteousness? When they became free from sin. When did they become free from sin? When they rose from that watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. Now, <clears throat> is that just your take on that, Freddie? Is that just a, an expedient way to go about doing things if you happen to have a whole lot of water? Or is that by God's design his salvation plan. Briefly stated, nonetheless. But yet a part of that which cannot be compromised. When we see the distinctions that do exist, then we have to be able to make a differentiation between those things that matter and those things that don't. Does baptism matter? Well, yes, it does. Does baptism stand between an alien sinner and salvation? Yes, it does. In the absence of water baptism, is a person still lost in their sin? Yes, they are. But that's just what you think, isn't it? That's what the Bible teaches. And it was upon that that there could be agreement, joint participation, and wholehearted acceptance of each other relative to the work of Paul and Barnabas and the apostles in Jerusalem. But that's just one example. Believe it or not, there are a whole lot of examples. And believe it or not as well, time is swiftly passing while we oftentimes sit on our hands and do not know the distinctions like we should and thus do not obey the distinctions as we should. Colossians chapter 2, for further reinforcement, buried with him by baptism. So to leave the impression there that we're not talking about sprinkling, we're not talking about pouring. We're talking about being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And then, when we have the first gospel sermon being preached in its fullness on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, here when people are led to the conclusion that they have with wicked hands crucified and slain the Son of God and cry out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What does Peter tell us? Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, that's Jews, your children, your descendants, to all them that are far off. That's the Gentiles. As many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, what those people think that Peter was telling them they need to do. We don't have to guess. Verse 41 tells us, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Well, what about those that didn't gladly receive his word? They weren't baptized. And they weren't added 
3,000 that day to the Lord's church. But those that gladly received his word were. Now, is that a matter of faith or is that a matter of opinion? Is that a matter of God's law? Or is that just a, an expediency? Does the Bible tell the difference? Well, sure it does. And it's as clear as the nose on my face, which is very clear. In spite of that, and how clear that is, just as clearly we need to recognize that God has always left some decision in that expedient area. And He has expected men and women to use their best judgment in making those decisions. Friends, just as, just as wrong as it would be for us to take something like the essential nature of water baptism, immersion in water for the remission of sins, at which point the person is added by the Lord, the Lord's church, just as wrong as it would be for us to take that Bible fact and all the surrounding Bible facts that substantiate that and set it over here as if it's simply an expediency that we're used to and that we continue to promote, but it doesn't really matter about anybody else. Just as wrong as it would be for us to do that, it is equally as wrong to take something that does not matter, an expedient matter, a matter of judgment, a matter of expediency, and treating it as if it is important in the same vein as water baptism for remission of sin. It's wrong. And it is those areas that we find so much difficulty and turmoil that oftentimes result. I want you to look at an example. And this one example will suffice. That silly clock up there will go way too fast. In Acts chapter 15, let's look at this one example and make an application of it, then we'll come back and try to tie some loose strings together tonight. Of course, we know that since we're in Acts chapter 15, we know that the first missionary journey is already done over. We know that after Paul and, and Barnabas have left from Antioch and have gone on this missionary journey, they've came back at the end of the previous chapter and they've rehearsed all that God did with them and all that. Okay. Now, here's another opportunity for another missionary journey. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go up again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the Word of God and see how they do. Man, I want to go. Would you like to go? Paul and Barnabas have been having to run from city to city on the first missionary journey to salvage their lives. They're making the gospel known to all these people who are clueless until they get there. And now we're going to go back and visit those congregations. Man, that'd be fun. Scary. Be, be fearful. <laughs> Might have to be able to run fast. But it would be an exciting thing to participate in. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname is Mark. Now, if you're thinking ahead, that's good that you can. John Mark. Seems like I remember that name earlier. Not just as the one who gave us the gospel according to Mark, but I think I remember him earlier maybe at the beginning point of the first missionary journey. Well, Paul thought it not good to take him with them. Why? He had departed from them from Pamphylia and would not go with them to the work. Oh, yeah, that's it. Remember now, don't you? He had started on the first missionary journey. But then, for some reason, the homesick, he went back home. So here, Paul don't want to take him. Barnabas, who is kin to him, cousin, wants to take him. The contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Wow. I mean, here we had just a few minutes ago, the right hand of fellowship, and boy, is with us in the work. And now here we've got to the point where something has happened here and seems to have messed up what we're trying to do. Well, 
That doesn't stop Paul, though. Paul chose Silas. They departed, been recommend, recommended by the brethren of the grace of God, and they went and sailed through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Now, I want you to think about this. Barnabas was determined to take John. Pardon me. Sure what? But according to the word that's used in the New King James is that Paul insisted to not take John. Determined to take John, insist not take John. Sounds like a, an unget overable situation here, doesn't it? And of course, as we read this a few months ago, it was. Neither one of them gave on it, did they? As a matter of fact, the text says that it was a sharp contention. Now, here's the question. Was fellowship broken between these two soldiers of the cross? I mean, they quit working together. One went one way with Silas, and one went another way with John Mark. Was fellowship broken, though, with them? They were no longer working side by side, jointly participating with each other, were they? Does that mean that fellowship was broke between them? I don't think so. Yes, it is. After this took place, did either one of these fellows try to destroy the influence of the other one? If there is any of that going on, there's no indication in the text, is there? Don't find it nowhere. Did Paul sit down and write a letter and circulate that letter questioning whether Barnabas was even sound anymore for taking somebody like John Mark with him on a missionary journey? There again, in the absence of there being any book, chapter, and verse on that, then we'd have to say, don't think so. Don't think so. Well, how about Barnabas? Did he have ties to a local paper? And did he write an article in a local paper and talk about this former partner of his who was, who was lacking in a whole lot of personal traits and skills that he needed, such as being forgiving, being compassionate, being kind to this young guy? No, we don't see that either. Hmm. As a matter of fact, when you look at what the text says, that's always an eye-opener. About 12 years later, Paul sends instructions and welcomes John Mark to come and work with him if he wants to. And then 16 years later, as Paul is writing his last epistle, right before he's martyred for the cause of Christ, he asked Timothy to pick up John Mark and to bring him with him because he could be very useful to his work. Well, let's see. There was one missionary journey, sharp contention, two missionary journeys. Why do you think that this whole episode is recorded for us? It may be sort of like, I ask the question sometimes, why does God go into such detail in this floating vessel that's going to save Noah and his family in Genesis chapter 6? Why does God go into such detail telling Moses how to construct the tabernacle and, and the number of rings and the type of linen to be used and, and all the way down to what kind of cloth to use in the clothes of the priest. Why does God go into all that detail? I submit that it's there for a purpose, not just to fill up space. Reckon it's maybe there to teach lessons. And maybe by stressing those things that might look to us obscure, then it gets the job done because it draws our attention to it in a greater way. That might be why we have this here. I guarantee you one thing. If a mere human being was writing a biography of the Apostle Paul or of Barnabas either one, then they would not have chronicled this problem here. They'd have left it out. Which leads me to conclude that this is an inspired document because it's included and not left out. 
Is this the purpose of what we've got here? Because we know that Paul and Barnabas were both probably alive when this is circulated. And so this is being sent out to embarrass Paul and Barnabas. I just don't think that's it. Do you? How about this is a good example of how brethren are to deal with disagreements. You get this point. Disagreements about matters like this. And that is a distinction that is deserving of being made. The distinction was whether we'll take John or not. It wasn't whether we're going to require those who hear the gospel to be baptized or not. It was whether John can be of asset to us on this second missionary journey. Not, are we going to set aside some clear command of God relative to acceptable worship? Matters that matter entertain different procedures than the one followed here. But matters that ultimately don't matter follow the pattern that is given here. What about other matters? Well, we'll have to talk about that tonight. The Lord will. You see, when it comes to this wonderful privilege that is ours, to be children of God, to enjoy the forgiveness of our sins, with the realization that we can know the truth, live according to the truth, the truth will set us free, all of that, comes the necessary ingredient on our part, and that is the desire to know and to do more so that I can be more for God. We oftentimes quote from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Wonderful concept. But that... Verse doesn't stop there. It says, If any man minister, let us serve. Let him do it as of the ability that God giveth. And then guess what the result's going to be? Whether you minister or serve with the ability that God gives you, or you speak as the oracle of God, then that will result in God being glorified through Christ Jesus. Now, in the absence of serving the Lord and my fellow man, including my brethren, in the absence of of speaking as the oracles of God, then there's no way I'm going to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. But when I do, I can. And that not only is required, friends and brethren, that is deserved by God. Don't you think? Whatever I can give is not enough, but yet I'll give it. And hope and work to be able to give much more. Are you a Christian this day and can say that with me? Not because of your highfalutin abilities, but because of God's wonderful grace and your desire to walk in it to heaven above. If you've never been baptized into Christ as a penitent, believing, confessor for the forgiveness of your sins, why not do so today? Maybe in times past you did just that, but have wandered back into the world of sin and sorrow and need to restore, be restored to a right relationship with God. By all means, take advantage of the opportunity this morning to return and to be restored even right now while we stand and while we sing.